All right, so our next speaker is uh, Susan Murphy from the University of Michigan. Uh, Susan is currently a MacArthur Fellow uh, since 2014, and uh, um, our, most of her research is on clinical trials and specifically dynamic uh, clinical trials. Uh, and for this, she uses uh, reinforcement learning, causal inference, and high dimensional statistics. And today, she will be talking about mobile health and statistics. Thanks. Uh, I actually changed the title. Uh, <laughs> when we got the email about how we should be speaking more about the future of statistics, I just changed my talk. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, okay. So what are, uh, our goal, uh, I belong to a group of investigators, and our, our long-term goal is it really concerns the maintenance of behavior change. But quantitatively, you could think of this as developing um, the data analysis methods, data science, how to collect data, how to analyze it, to facilitate designing effective, continually learning mobile health interventions. And I'll uh, speak about two different applications uh, during this talk. One is Heart Steps. Heart Steps involves a uh, wearable bracelet. I have one on my wrist here, and then an app on your phone. I just I want to uh, mention that this area of research is, to the best of my knowledge, is completely open from a statistical perspective. And we really need to be involved in mobile health. Right now, it's dominated by scientists from other fields, and a statistical perspective is not being taken at all. OK, so uh, what kind of data do we get from wearable devices um, that can both collect information as well as provide treatments? So uh, you can think of each individual contributing a sequence, a time series of observation, action, response. I call it a proximal response. Uh, in CS, uh, often it's called a reward, or in operations research, a cost or a utility. So it's, for us, it's a time-varying outcome, a time-varying response. So observation, action, response, observation, action, response, and so on and so forth. For us, the actions are uh, treatments. The observations tend to be pretty high dimensional. I'm going to talk about each of these in turn shortly. So um, first, decision times. These are the times at which I collect information and I provide actions. Um, so there tends to be two types of decision times you see in this world, in the world of mobile health. The first is at regular intervals in time. And these can be at very, very close intervals in time. For example, in a, um, a recovery support intervention for people who had alcoholism or trying to stay clean, um, one of the things they want to do is send an alert to the person whenever the person gets within 10 meters of the liquor store where they used to buy liquor. So here the decision times are very frequently, like once every minute, because you have to constantly monitor them so they don't get into the store before. Uh, another type of decision time that occurs in this area is user demand. And this is pretty common as well. There tends to be a button on the phone that the person can press and request help. For example, if I'm striving with an addiction, I could press help because I'm feeling a lot of craving. And then it would send an automated text message to a mentor or to staff or so, something of that type. Hard steps. The intervention heart steps, this is an intervention I showed you on the, the screenshot on the last slide. This is to help people who are sedentary become less sedentary to increase activity in their life. It has two types of decision times. One is, we call it more momentary. It's every, uh, approximately every two to two and a half hours. The way um, the intervals were determined is uh, one of the individuals on the team uh, has been working with Jawbone, who builds these bracelets, and had access to their data. And it turns out, if you look at sedentary people, if they are active, they tend to be active either before work, around midday, around mid-afternoon, right at the end of work, and then in the evening. So approximately every two to two and a half hours. So five, around five times a day. And that's the reason why the decision times are spaced like that. These are the opportunities to, at which someone might be more active. And there's also a daily decision time every evening. Um, uh, I'll show you a screenshot about how that works shortly. The observations, oh, I should have put O here. This should be O 
right here. Um, they're, they're come in two flavors, passively collected and actively collected. And the whole game in this, liter in this field is to move as much of the active data collection to the passive setting. <laughs> Um, so uh, I, I've given you a list of the kinds of things. So we, the, of course, the phone itself has a variety of sensors that can be used to collect data. And then in addition, you have the wearable, a wearable device if you're using a wearable device. In Heart Steps, we have um, classifiers that are built into the phone that um, uh, classify whether or not you're walking, driving, or standing. Um, we know the weather, we know the location you're at, we know how busy your Google Calendar is, uh, we know your step count from the bracelet, and so on. A whole variety of, um, a whole variety of information. Again, um, one of the big goals here is to reduce the amount of actively collected data. There's some really interesting statistical problems there. Uh, actions, these are um, treatments that can be provided at a decision time. And when I first got into this field, I thought, you know, what kind of, ac <laughs> what kind of treatment can you give someone with a mobile device? It just doesn't seem like there's much you could do. Um, that's, that's completely wrong. It turns out there's a vast array of types of interventions that can be provided. There's behavioral interventions where one suggests a alternative activity. You're feeling a lot of craving. Instead, they suggest you walk or you avoid certain locations that are not good for you. There's cognitive interventions that are about, say, you have trying to quit smoking and you, you had a lapse, so how might you think about that so that you keep your spirits up and keep trying. There's social interventions where we connect you to other people, um, and so on and so forth. There's just a vast array of types of interventions that can be provided. And then uh, second, it's whether to provide a treatment at all. And actually, this is where I focus most of my uh, attention. I think as a statistician, um, one has to recognize that this data is extremely noisy. So if we're going to get a signal, on, off might be the place we can get it. And more importantly, from a scientific perspective, this is a device that's with you all the time. I don't know how you are with your smartphone, but my smartphone and me, we live together. You know, I go take a shower, the smartphone sits on the sink. I go to sleep, the smartphone is right next to my bed. My, me and my smartphone, we're best friends, right? And so the potential for burden here is profound. The provincial, and in fact, most mobile health interventions or people don't use them after a very short period of time. And I think it's mainly because of burden. So that's one of the big challenges in this field. So whether to provide a treatment, I think, is really important. And we're going to focus on that in, for the remainder of the, this small talk. Uh, we have uh, in Heart Steps this sedentary intervention. Uh, it has two types of treatments, uh, a momentary lock screen message, I'll show you a picture shortly, and uh, daily activity planning. Uh, daily activity planning is where you plan how you're going to go, you're going to be active the next day. So I, am, I may uh, write in that I'm going to go to the gym, gym at 6, I'll go straight from work to the gym at 6 p.m. That would be a daily activity plan. Okay, yeah, here's a little screenshot of what daily activity planning might be. It, uh, it occurs in the evening, at the decision time in the evening. You, we might not bother you at all. Uh, or you might get a drop-down menu of different things you might choose um, to do to plan tomorrow to get more activity in your life. Um, or you may generate a plan. This is just this would just be an open box, and you write in, you type in what you would do. Uh, if you type in plans that you end up uh, becoming active with, they may move to this list. Um, so the list tends to it ends up being tailored to you in this with this app. The momentary lock screen recommendation. We're going to spend most. Uh, I'll focus most of my attention on this. It's very interesting, and it points to some really. Um, delicate issues that arise in the mobile health field. Um, so there's, this is, remember this is around five times a day. Uh, Heart Steps is a 42-day study, so we're talking about 210 times. Um, and at each of those five times, uh, you could get no message, we don't bother you at all. Or you might get, uh, your phone would ping, uh, the lock screen would light up, and you, you could get a message. Uh, and it's just a little suggestion that, to help you be uh, more active at this moment, in, at, just in the near future. So uh, this was in Ann Arbor uh, in March 
uh, it was in the afternoon on a weekend. This message is tailored to that. It's uh, in the afternoon on a weekend. It was pretty chilly. It was sunny. And so the suggestion is appropriate to something at that time. There's three ways you can uh, wipe this suggestion off your phone. You can give it a thumbs down, in which case the suggestion goes away. You can give it a thumbs up, in which case the suggestion goes away. So this is all about uh, unobtrusively collecting burden or um, yeah, uh, utility. And then in the last one, in the middle, there's this smooth snooze bell. And if you press the snooze bell, uh, a drop-down menu comes on and uh, comes down, and you can snooze the intervention for four, eight, or 12 hours. That's considered extremely important if you want to keep people uh, with you for a longer period of time to allow them to turn off the intervention. OK, and then lastly, the last component of the, the type of the data is the proximal response. Uh, and in heart steps, it's uh, the activity in the hour following a decision time. So you may or may not have gotten a suggestion at that decision time, but it's the activity in the hour following that. And in general, in most, in, at least in the mobile health areas that I'm, I work in, the actions are all about helping you, uh, helping you in the near term. They may have long-term effects, like you could learn ideas that you might try later on. So they, hopefully there will be delayed effects. But the way the interventions are designed is to get you to help you in the near term, proximally. So this is, that's why I use this word proximal response to trigger that. Uh, another application, uh, some hard steps is to go into the field this summer. Um, this will go in in the fall. This is a smoking cessation study. Um, this, uh, this involves individuals um, who are trying to quit smoking. It's a 14-day study, and they're, uh, it's a proof of concept because they're wearing a chest band and an arm band, and the arm band is allowing us to identify if they smoke. And the chest band measures, uh, measures stress along with the arm band. And the intervention is both with the smartwatch and the smartphone. And here, up to five times a day, um, they can get a little message will come on their smartphone that reminds them of how they might uh, reduce their stress. Um, at the beginning of the study, they're uh, trained four different ways they can reduce their stress. And there's information on the phone about those four different ways that they can access at any time. And then in the, the watch, uh, at that five times, that little message may occur, and it's it's uh, local to, it's specific for one of those different ways to reduce your stress. So the message occurs, and at the same time, that app will appear on their phone, and they can make use of the app or not. It's up to them, but the cue is the message to practice that particular stress reducing intervention. And a, a, the kind of question here is um, an important question in this setting is should the current level of stress be used to decide whether to provide a stress reduction suggestion? And it's thought there's a lot of controversy on the team. Um, some of us feel that if someone's really stressed out, you shouldn't be bothering them at all. And so that's an open question. Will that, um, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, if you pilot these things, you know the burden level, I'm telling you. We have to be really careful. OK. Um, so I want to talk about the goals of our group. Um, this is, uh, we have, of course, as a statistician, the way I came to this area was I was interested in this topic. This is where cool statistics, sort of online control theory, that sort of thing. I mean, you know, of course, this is what I wanted to do, right? But uh, it took me a while. It was, I was very slow. But it took me a while, and I realized that a whole host of steps had to be gone through prior to that, prior to doing this cool mathematics or uh, online training. And the reason why is because we have to make it possible for people to run these studies, to propose these studies, get these studies funded, to run these studies. We have to make it possible for our collaborators to advance their science. We can't just think, oh, I want to advance my science. I have to facilitate them advancing their science as well. 
Um, and so we're gonna st what I'm going to do today is I'm just going to talk to you about 1 and 3. One, I'll, uh, I, and what I want to do is I, I just want to highlight, I'm not going to show you virtually almost no math, very little math, but I want to highlight some of the really cool things about these, these problems. And I'll do that in one. And then I'm going to do three, because I know there's a lot of engineers in the audience. And that's, I'm doing that for a selfish reason, because maybe I'll get some critical comments. OK. Uh, so um, number one, this is about how can we develop, design an, a clinical trial so that we can collect high, da high quality data that will allow us to build these uh, mobile health interventions. Essentially, what we're doing is we want to build a control policy. Um, well, we want to go even further than that, but um, I'll start off with that. So uh, what we're proposing is that people run a micro-randomized trial. This word now is already out in the community. People are already running them. Um, and in these trials, each person is randomized at each decision point. So in the case of heart steps, there was 210, so it's 210 randomizations. And I'm going to call them sequential full factorial designs. Um, uh, I've spent now a good bit of time speaking with experimental design experts. And right now, there is no, there has not been any real experimental design in this field. And there's a real need for that. And I'll indicate uh, later uh, more about that. What does sequential mean? Sequential here means within a person. It's very important within a person. Each person, remember, each person who enters heart steps uh, goes through their life. It's a 42-day study. At each time, five times a day, they're being randomized. So within, each, within a person, they're being randomized multiple times, 210 times. Sequential is within a person, not across people. So it's, these are not adaptive clinical trial designs. In fact, they have very little to do with adaptive. Um, and they're, they're full factor, they're sequ and the sequential should key you, because when I say full factorial, you should think, if you're a statistician and you're, you had some experimental design, you should think of main effects, factorial designs. Well, just as we have um, time-varying sequential treatment, we're going to end up with time-varying main effects. It's a very different way to think. Um, so I want to just go back to, uh, again, with heart steps. Here we're going to focus on whether or not we provide an intervention, uh, a, a message. These are tailored messages, whether we provide the message or not. So uh, the action is binary. The randomization. OK, so again, this is another thing that's taken, I mean, it's pretty clear now. But at first, I was very resistant to this. I, as a statistician, wanted the randomization to be 1 half, 1 half. Of course. Why? I get high power. That's completely uh, inappropriate in this setting because of the burden issue. You cannot be prompt uh, beeping and pinging these people too much. And in fact, in this particular case, the investigator said, look, let's say on average two times a day. And that's the reason there's five opportunities. That's the reason why it's a 0.4 probability. In a, um, a study in which we had more decision times, that probability might be even more <laughs> skewed. And it's the burden issue. It has to come to your mind the whole time. And what we're going to do is we're going to, so the first thing you have to do if you're applying for funds to run one of these studies is you have to justify the number of people you want to bring in you want to bring into your trial. So the, uh, the big thing is how to size the study. What's the sample size? And what we're going to do is size it to detect a proximal effect. Why? Because when you talk to the behavioral scientists, the clinical scientists, the main purpose of that intervention, that action, those five times, is to affect the person's behavior in the near, in the proximal. Uh, in a proximal way, in the next hour, in the next 30 minutes, or whatever. That's the reason. This is not to say there won't be delayed effects. That's not what we're saying. Um, OK, so here's something that it took me a long time to get realized in my head. And it's, it's fine. now I'm, I'm, I'm convinced that uh, if we're going to work in the, mobile health, in the mobile health field, this issue of availability is going to be a dominant issue, and it's one that we're going to just have to live with. Except in very simplistic settings, uh, we're going to have to pay attention to the issue of availability. Um, 
And that is that we can only provide a treatment when the intervention is on. So let's go back to hard steps. In hard steps, um, if the classifier on the phone uh, classifies you as driving a car, we cannot have your phone ping, light up, and suggest that you go and walk. We won't get it. It's not ethical for us to, we might distract you. So that's a time when the intervention is off. If um, you're currently walking around and moving, say you're, yeah, if you're walking and the classifier detects that, states that you're walking, again, we don't want to ping you and tell you you should walk. Scientifically, it doesn't make any sense. So there's going to be scientific times in which the intervention must be off. You're unavailable. And then lastly, there's times at which you have decided that you're unavailable. You have turned off the intervention. So we saw one way for the users in hard steps to turn off the intervention on the lock screen. In general, they can turn it off at any time, actually, for up to 12 hours. So uh, I'm just going to summarize. There's uh, ethical reasons why people might not be available at a given decision time. There are scientific reasons. They're already performing the desired activity. And then, in a sense, we can think of it, in a sense, they remove consent at a particular time. I'm not allowing you to intervene with me at this time. I'm going to an, a review committee meeting for the whole day. I'm going to turn off this intervention for the day. So this is going to rear its head. And if you're interested in causal inference, of course, this is going to play a big, we have to be very thoughtful. OK. Oh, yes, right, causal inference. So uh, I have to be, I want to be precise about, uh, I said we were going to size this to detect a proximal effect. I want to be really clear in my own mind. I want to define exactly what we mean by proximal effect. And so what I'm going to do is use the uh, notation of potential outcomes. It's commonly used in uh, causal inference. And so. Uh, You'll see I'm not going to do anything really sophisticated here. So think of the capital A's. These are randomized uh, treatments. There's a whole sequence here. If they have a bar, that means the whole sequence up to the decision time J. The lower cases are realizations. In our case, in heart steps, it's a binary treatment. So this is a sequence of zeros and ones. Uh, our response, our proximal response after decision time J, that is the response J plus 1, it's can be an outcome of the treatments that you provided prior to that time. That's why it's indexed by the sequence of ones and zeros. Now, some of which you might not have experienced because you weren't available, but it's still in indexed by that. Um, your availability at time decision time J is indexed by the prior treatments as well. Notice the prior treatments index the availability at decision time J but the present and prior treatments index the, the response after decision time J. It's important to notice. So this acknowledges this endogenous character of availability. And actually, um, in the last uh, talk, someone talked about the feedback loop. We can imagine there's, there's going to be pretty big feedback loops right here. In fact, if someone is really being overtreated, they may be unavailable. Or if for example, they've really gotten engaged with our intervention, then every time one of those decisions, those five times a day come about, they may be walking. So they're going to be unavailable. This is, so this is endogenous in the sense that it's an outcome of prior treatment, but not present. Not present treatment, not treatment at time J. So we're going to define the proximal main effect. So I use the word main effect because uh, I'm, this is in, um, in reference to the fact that we're talking about factorial designs. And in factorial designs, we s usually size them to detect main effects. Uh, here's a main effect at each decision time j. It's your, it's your activity following uh, an, a suggestion that's 1 versus your activity following no suggestion that's coded by 0. And it's among the people who are currently available. OK, so I'm going I'm to talk about this uh, a little bit. So this expectation here, it averages over your activity. You know, there's variation in whether you're going to be act active. It also averages over the other treat the past treatments, like all good main effects. Main effects average over the other treatments. 
That's how it's like a factorial design. But it's different from a factorial, uh, a main effect in a factorial design, and then it's conditional. It's only among a certain subpopulation, a subpopulation of available people. So I want to, now I'm going to talk about, uh, uh, let's just think about how this might change as the decision times go through. So say we have 210 decision times. How might this main effect vary across decision times? So here's one way it might vary. Um, at the beginning, everybody gets their phone. They're a little confused. So th they, don't, they don't really act on the messages. They're getting used to getting messages. Then with time, they start to buy, you know, buy in, they get engaged. So when they get a message, they try it out. If they don't, they don't do anything. Then time goes on, they get more and more habituated to, potentially to the messages. They start to not even see them. <laughs> and so the effect goes down again. You might expect to see that. Okay. There's another reason why this main effect may vary over time. And that's because the subpopulation among whom you're assessing the effect of the, inner, the suggestion is varying over time. So initially, probably most people, no one's learned to be active. No one's become totally disengaged, right? So initially, maybe most people are available. And then we'll go through, and some people will become more active, and they'll, they won't be in the sub, if the people who are active won't be in that subpopulation at time j. The people who are disengaged, they will have turned off the intervention. They won't be in the sub. Now, but the inter I do want to mention this intervention can only be turned off for 12 hours, so people oft they'll come back in continually. Uh, so in other words, uh, there's two reasons why this main effect varies with time. It varies with time because the effect itself varies with time, may vary with time due to habituation or people learning how to utilize the suggestions. And secondly, it varies with time because the subpopulation of individuals among whom we're assessing the effect may vary with time. So we may not have much of an effect towards the end of the study because we only have highly people who are just totally, they're just, they don't, you know, they're habituated. They don't see it. Uh, the randomization involve, it, it imply, if you're used to causal inference, you're used to this kind of a statement. The randomization and um, other assu uh, uh, technical assumptions imply that we can write our S to man, which is in terms of potential outcomes, in ter we can rewrite that in terms of data. So this is just the usual expectation over that you can calculate with your data. Uh, and I'm going to call this difference um, beta just on the next slide. This is a causal effect, right? It's a kind of odd causal effect. Sometimes people think it's not a causal effect because we're conditioning on an endogenous variable. But it's a causal effect among the available people. Among the available people, 40% are provided a message and 60% are not. And that's randomized. So what we uh, proposed is we propose that you um, design and size these micro-randomized trials to, to detect this proximal effect. And it's a, so actually it turns out now the statistics gets real simple. Um, you uh, just have to be a little careful. I'm just going to show you one more slide on this topic. So the way we construct the test statistic, um, we could just focus on a, a, there's, J goes from 1 to 210 in the case of heart steps. We could say, oh, we're going to look for a general alternative to this null hypothesis, but that doesn't really make a lot of sense in this setting. Why? Because it's unlikely that the effect of the intervention is going to change grossly from decision point to decision point, or that the group of available people will change grossly from decision point to decision point. So what we do is we allow people to specify an alternative, a parametric alternative that they want to focus the, uh, tr the test statistic on. Here's one, for example, this one takes the five times a day and makes it uh, averages over days. So this, is, this just <coughs> goes by day. Uh, so here's a quadratic exemplifying. Initially, there's no effect of the intervention. The, inter the effect of the intervention increases because people begin to utilize the little suggestions 
when they get them, and then they habituate, and so it may go down again as time goes on. One can imagine other parametric alternatives. This is pretty common, this, uh, this approach to um, using a parametric alternative. It turns out um, in toxicology, people use this a lot. And in fact, if we, after we've done a number of these studies, um, I, if I don't see very much of a downturn, we're going to end up using a linear <coughs> instead. There's no goal here. This is not, we're not trying to fit a model. We're doing a test. Right? We're just testing. So even if, even if the true curve looks like this, it just levels off, it would be better just to use two degrees of freedom and do a, with a, use a linear. I'll get a better test. I'm wasting a degree of freedom here. So if, if we don't see downturns, uh, we'll probably not use a quadratic. OK, so here's the next message. I'm sure uh, most of you, or well, many of you know this next message. But I have to be honest, um, when the student first uh, he did, we, we developed the statistic, we did our analysis, you know, we um, did a lot of simulations, and we uh, developed the sample size calculator, and the student, the grad student is a very smart grad student, he comes to me and he gives me the results, and I tell him he programmed it all wrong. And it's because I didn't understand a very subtle, uh, what I feel is a subtle point. So I'm just going to, I want to explain to you this subtle point here. Uh, uh, there's 210 times right here. So suppose I just wanted to size the study to detect the effect of the intervention at the very first time point. Let's just pretend. 40% of my people would be in one arm. They'd get the message. 60% would not. That's going to require a big data, big, a large amount of data, right? A large number of people. Because the only contrast I have is between person contrasts. 40%, at the first time point, 40% will get the message, 60% won't. However, by focusing on a parametric alternative, what I do is I enable the use of within-person contrasts because I'm depending on the fact that my subpopulation won't change too much from one time point to the next. It won't, and the effect won't change too much from one time to point to the next. So you enable both within-person contrasts between when they get a message versus they don't, as well as between. That means the sample sizes are much smaller than we're used to. Um, that's what this says right here. Um, and so I'll show you. I'm not showing the test statistic. I didn't want to um, go through that. I have something else I want to talk about. But um, here's a, from our sample size calculator. These are in terms of standard deviations of the y variable, the proximal response. So this is 0.06 standard deviations. This is 0.08 standard deviations, 0.1 standard deviations. Here is 70% availability, 50% availability. These are the kind of sample sizes you see. So um, if you expect to see a 0.1 difference in standard deviation if you get a message versus not, uh, you can have pretty small numbers of people in this study. And it's because of the ability to use within-person contrast as well as between-person contrast. Of course, uh, an important thing to realize here is, at least in mobile health, we don't have a good feeling for what kinds of effects in terms of the num um, number of standard deviations we should see. So even though these look small, if you're used to this sort of thing, they may not be small. This may be quite large, actually. We, I, we just don't know yet. OK, some of the challenges from a statistical point of view, these are a very different type of factorial design. Um, we have a time-varying treatment that is time-varying factors. That means we end up with time-varying main effects, time-varying two-way interactions. And we have delayed effects, too. Um, I am positive there has got to be a better way to design these studies. Must be. Um, and another thing, too, is uh, there's enormous interest in designing the studies to uh, detect interactions between the factors. Remember, we had uh, a, an evening intervention, which was about goal setting for the next day, as well as the momentary intervention, which was the suggestions. And another way to size this study would have been to size it to try and detect an interaction between the two, because that's closer to their th the theories the, uh, the scientists have when they think of these studies. So how do you do that here? Uh, um, I don't know. Um, there's not a lot out there. 
uh, okay, so I'm going to go on. I'm going to go to the next uh, challenge. Um, there's now quite uh, now. Uh, I just want to mention that uh, these micro-randomized trials. Um, uh, we talked about them to several scientists about a year ago, and I no a year and a half ago. And then last fall, I saw one of them, and he's already won, run one of the trials. So they're being picked up pretty rapidly. Um, so, uh, I, number two, I'm not going to go over it. I just want to point out this area, if you're interested in causal inference, inference is extremely interesting. And we are talking about data from micro-randomized study. We have randomized our actions. But if you're not thoughtful in how you analyze the data, you can really mess up things. Um, and the clinical scientists and the behavioral scientists, they are extremely interested in assessing whether or not you have interactions between treatment and the context of the individual. The interest in this is profound. Um, it's of lower interest to a statistician uh, because the methods are kind of plain as long as you're careful about the causal inference. But there's profound interest on the scientific side. We're going to talk about three. Um, this is uh, the control setting. And uh, it's getting closer and closer to what I really am interested in, number four. OK, so right now, how are people developing these mobile health interventions um, called treatment policies? Um, actually, we don't use the word treatment policy. We use another word, which is more amenable to that field. But they, what they do is they, they, uh, have a, they usually have a, a, a theories, behavioral theories, about how people respond to stress, how people respond to the location they're in. And they form decision rules. They form them completely to, the, to, to a large extent. And then they code them up, and they do a two-arm trial. The form decision rules. That's their mobile intervention versus some sort of treatment, standard treatment. That's what the normal, that's what most, that's what you pretty much always see. And so what we want to do is develop uh, me methods to use with data, preferably micro-randomized data or randomized data, to develop more evidence-based policies. Uh, a caveat in this, and something that really constrains us, is the desire that the policy be interpretable. Because we're working as part of collaborative teams, and the scientists need to be able to look at the form of these policies and help it help and uh, understand them and buy into it, as well as it helps them further develop their theories in their field. So this is going to constrain how I'm going to proceed over the next couple of slides. So uh, what we want to do is we, in the next couple of slides, uh, we aim to construct a treatment policy which is bounded away from 0 and 1. It's going to be a stochastic policy. And why are we doing this? And I think this is, I wanted to bring this up because I think this is really interesting as a statistician. It's, if you uh, go back in psychology, there's this whole um, theory about intermittent reinforcement and about habituation. And it's known in these, these uh, domains that if you want to reduce the rate at which people get bored or the rate at which they habituate to messages, you introduce variation. You introduce randomness. So what is happening here is, am I almost done? I don't remember my time. In, in like two minutes? OK. Um, what's happening here is that uh, uh, this is a chance for us to have a setting where randomness is part of the therapeutic treatment. This is amazing as a statistician to think to yourself that all of a sudden, randomness will be part, have a therapeutic uh, effect. Um, I can't, so I went too slow, so oh, it's probably OK. I just want to, so I won't be able to go over my control theory too bad. I'll just have to trap Muther another time. <laughs> uh, huh? You're a bit OK, good. <laughs> uh, I just, can I go through some of the, ch the challenges here? Because I think I want people to join this field. Um, so uh, any method you use in control theory, they have to have 
permit scientists to test hypotheses, to test whether or not it's really necessary to collect <coughs> certain expensive information. If you don't allow them to do that, it's a non-starter. Um, in this setting, missing data is a profound problem, profound. And some of that missing data is going to be informative. How are you going to handle that? It's really an important question. Uh, how do you reduce the amount of self-report data? Of course, we can develop better sensors, but there's a lot of statistical approaches to doing this. No one's using them. Um, how do you detect that someone's starting to disengage so that you can do something about it? It's open. How are we going to do all of this? And then how do you measure burden? Okay, this is my last slide. Thanks. Any questions? Yeah. <coughs> do I just yell? Yep. Um, I work for the grid so um, I design online technology so we can experiment and adapt. Mm -hmm. um, like education, I can already see how all these methods would be really valuable. But um, more generally, it seems like people have emphasized the technology can be used to collect data and find patterns, but there's been less emphasis on the fact that technology can also let us send data back out in the form of ways of changing technology, adjusting online courses, adjusting mobile apps like you've done. Do you have any thoughts about what are the main obstacles to people in machine learning statistics focusing more on this question? Of how do we design, you know, micro designs? How do we adapt and precise in real world systems? What are the main obstacles? I think the main obstacle in this field is, uh, at least this has been my experience, is that we go into meetings with behavioral scientists and we insist that they learn our language. Um, that's a big problem. We ignore their need to develop their own science. That's an enormous problem. We ignore um, how, how you can uh, convince reviewers or give guarantees to reviewers that we're going to use their money wisely. And we just want to all, everybody's like me, I just want to do that last thing and develop, do an online algorithm. That's all I care about. And instead, I, uh, we really have to go to where the science is. We can't directly do the totally coolest thing. And in fact, in the end, our online algorithm will be better if we go through these steps. Jumping to the end is not the way. That's uh, my feeling. It's better to go through these steps and work collaboratively. Yeah. yeah just curious about, you mentioned the clinical trials and the treatment and sequential, sequential design. So the, what's the goal? The goal is trying to assess this normal intervention and any effect, for example, to change the <coughs> predictive behavior and so on. Is that, is that yeah, the yeah so, I, so the guarantee I give to the funders is that if you fund this trial, I will tell you with a certain power, blah, blah, blah. I'll tell you with a certain power whether or not this intervention has any signal at all. And then, of course, I'll do all kinds of very interesting scientific analyses, which are secondary analyses, which we all are thrilled to do. But I will give you that guarantee if you fund this study. All right, so we're running out of time, but we have a 15 minutes break now. And I'm sure Susan will be happy to take questions offline. Please uh, make sure to be back at the <laughs>